Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming tonight. I'm Stella Han. I'm a software engineer at Affirm, and I also lead the CMU TIBA alumni group. CMU TIBA's mission is to build a strong CMU community within the Bay Area, where our alumni are connected with the right people, resources, and opportunities to succeed and thrive. Today's panel is the second of our speaker series, and we also host many other initiatives like happy hours, hikes, and also a community just for founders. We also recently launched a new CMU TIBA Slack community for our alumni to come together and engage. And this online community has now grown to over 420 people. There's always a lot going on, so make sure to join our mailing list or Slack to stay informed. And before we begin, I'd like to take the time to thank our CMU TIBA board members and other volunteers. We are an independent org, and this event wouldn't be possible without their dedication to drive this community forward. So let's give them a warm round of applause. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our three CMU alumni who have all been incredible leaders in the consumer finance space. We have with us today Vishwas Prabhakara, Chief Operating Officer of Digit, Chris Fott, GM and Head of Expansion at Affirm, and David Zabowski, VP of Engineering at NerdWallet. Vish, would you like to start off, start us off and introduce yourself, what your role is, and what Digit is? Sure, thanks. Uh, my name is Vishwas Prabhakara. I'm the COO at Digit. Um, Digit is a personal finance fintech startup. Uh, our mission is to make financial help effortless for everyone. Uh, so practically what that means is we connect your checking account and we can automate your personal finances, starting with savings and secondly with credit card debt pay down. Um, so we use our machine learning algorithms to figure out how much we can save for you. What we hear most often from our customers is, I didn't know I could save until I started using Digit. Uh, that's a pretty rewarding thing to hear from your customers on a regular basis. The average customer goes from saving very little every year to uh, on average $2,500 a year with Digit without any big changes in their lifestyle. As a result, you can imagine how this breaks a lot of negative financial situations where if there's an emergency, now they have a rainy day fund. If they you know, want to get tickets to Coachella, they don't go into credit card debt, they have the money saved up because they set a goal on Digit. Um, so that's been exciting. The company's growing fast. Um, we're about 60 people now, up from 40 earlier this year, uh, and continuing to hire, um, and have made great strides in growing the team, but also growing the diversity of the team, which is very important to us. Um, I'll say that my job as COO is, um, it's def defined differently at different places. What I do at Digit is I help our senior leadership team set uh, company strategy and goals, and then functionally I manage everything that's not product engineering and design. So marketing, uh, legal, finance, HR, support, partnerships, et cetera. Hey, everybody. I'm David Zabowski. I'm the vice president of engineering at NerdWallet. Uh, so what NerdWallet does is um, we're fundamentally in the, in the business of helping people make the best financial decisions that they can, whatever that means for them. Um, whether or not it means that they need a great credit card, which is where we started, our business started on recommending credit cards, or whether it means something like helping them with their spending or their savings or their investing, whatever it might be, we try to make sure that they've got the information that they need at the time that they need it to make the, the right decisions. Um, it turns out that's really hard for people. Um, the, the sort of consumer problem that that is, is just um, in today's world, there's a lot of choices financial choices. There didn't used to be. There used to be a world where pretty much you got everything from one choice, your local bank or your local company, whatever it might be, financial institution. And then that was it. That was your choice. You got everything you needed from them. That changed. And when that changed, people got infinite choice. And now they have this decision-making problem. So we try to help them with that. We try to give them all the advice that they need so they can have confidence, like have really high confidence in the, that they're making good decisions that make sense for them, that won't harm them, that won't do something bad to their finances later. Uh, and we do that across the entire spectrum of, of financial decisions that people have to make. We are also growing. Um, we're also hiring. I'm supposed to always say that. But we are. We're, we're, we're growing a lot. We're hiring. We're doing very well. Um, we're in a good spot. We're more of a mid-stage startup than an early-stage startup. So we've, we started in the content world a while ago. And we're now at this space or at this stage where um, we're taking that to the next level for our, for our, our consumers. We're very consumer first. So people that like to work on consumer problems, this is a really nice place to be. Um, I personally like that. If you look at my history, I've worked on consumer internet stuff basically since there was an internet. Um, I actually, when I worked at CMU, 
um, used to reboot the ARPANET. Um, that's how old I am. So uh, don't ask me when I graduated. But, um, I literally, they would call me at 4 o'clock in the morning and I would reboot the ARPANET. It was kind of weird. Um, and I'm really happy to be here. So with that, I'm done. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Font. I lead, for lack of a better term, our expansion uh, initiatives at Affirm. Um, so welcome. So for those that don't know, Affirm, our, our mission is to, uh, I basically build uh, financial products that improve lives. So I'll defer to some of our colleagues here if I miss anything up. Um, we started about, I think it's about eight and a half years ago, uh, the thesis being post-2008, uh, the consumer interest in and trust in traditional financial products had fallen fairly dramatically, particularly in the millennial demographic. So we said, well, let's start with fixing consumer credit. Um, so the very first product that we developed was a, an installment loan offered at the point of sale as a payment method uh, for a merchant. So a lot of our background is PayPal. Our founder um, is the founding CTO of PayPal, uh, Max Levchin. So the idea was how can we offer a payment method through which we could issue an installment loan to consumers to make their purchase online. Um, and we've, we've since evolved from there. My focus has been, uh, along with a couple of people in this room, on how do we expand from an e-commerce only offering to an in-store offering, and now most recently leading our international expansion out of the U.S. Um, so a lot of us in the audience here are CMU alumni, and maybe your answer to this question can convince some people to go to CMU for grad school. I'm just kidding about that. Um, but how has CMU affected your choices in going to tech? Uh, <laughs> so I studied uh, business and computational finance, which is like options pricing theory which was miserably hard in, in undergrad, along with like Italian and acting. So none of these things led me to tech necessarily. Um, I was a, a management consulting for, for about four and a half years after, after undergrad, went to business school out here, and I think that's what kind of drew me into tech more than anything. Um, but I will say, especially out here in the West Coast, and I think within FinTech, um, Carnegie Mellon does have this very strong reputation, not only for computer science, um, but for the work ethic that I think has all been drilled into each and every one of us. We didn't necessarily have a party in school, like it feels like everybody else did, um, but I think that makes us very eligible to be hired. So that's kind of my way in, I guess. I, hello there. Yeah, um, I don't know that it was so much that CMU got me into tech, is that I was so into tech that it got me into CMU. I think it went the other way. I was just one of those kids who took everything apart and tried to figure out how it worked and when I, when I was trying to figure out where to go to school, the schools I looked at were places where you could figure things out like that, that were really like super techy and, and, and had that, that component of almost magic. Like tech was so cool that it was so much fun that you could figure this stuff out and you could actually change it. And you could make new things from it and you could create and invent things. And you, there was this hands-on like maker sense to it way before the maker movement or anything like that. That's what really drew me to it. And CMU was a pretty obvious choice for that. I'm also from the Pittsburgh area, so it was definitely on my radar. But it was it, the clear like winner for a place for me to go, so it was pretty obvious. Yeah, I think the thing is, when you think about CMU, different than I think uh, many other places, is like it's kind of a tech company, right? You got the business people, you got the CS people, you got the IS people, or the PMs, you got you know the drama people that you know are. <laughs> add a lot of life um, to, to the party. But um, I mean, this, the skills that you see are really interesting and it actually helped me kind of sample a lot of stuff, understand like where I fit into that ecosystem and where that kind of has been for me. Traditionally, it's been at the intersection of business and technology um, versus like being straight in as a developer or entirely on the business side. Um, and so that, that was something that I was able to discover. And so I guess less of like get me into tech, uh, help me find my place in tech and where I wanted to be. And I've kind of always been circling that area of, you know, how, how can I know enough about technology and do stuff in technology, but also at the same time, apply from a business perspective and grow it. David, you mentioned that you were building consumer-centric products ever since the internet existed. And Vish, I know you were leading a lot of product initiatives at Yelp. So how has leading a consumer-centric fintech company been different? 
Well, I think the thing to think about for Yelp is that it's basically a marketplace business, right? Um, and especially the, so on one side you have consumers, on the other side you have advertisers at Yelp. And the uh, part that I ran was very similar to OpenTable. We had restaurants on one side and consumers on the other. And I think the big difference for me, first of all, is going to a full consumer subscription model business. Um, no longer do I have 100 people in sales and account management, right? Uh, we have a small and mighty team and we're doing a lot with a marketing team that's helping acquire all of our customers. So I think that's, that's been one big change for me is like kind of leaving behind the marketplace experience and moving to a world where like everything is actually, you can apply a little more thought and effort and it's a little bit less about, you know, managing a large team to drive that growth. Um, so that's been fun. Um, I think on the FinTech side, and I think this is true in a lot of places that I've worked, including at Yelp is in, in the restaurant business, like I actually think it's valuable to hire people that don't know the industry versus people that know the industry. Now, obviously you need point experts in on the regulation side, the legal side, and just some experience and context on financial products. But um, I think it's very similar actually than that to most places where like, you want to bring in people that have a certain amount of, you know, naivete to it. They're like, why can't we do X, right? Well, let's go do that. Let's go build that. Why can't we automate this thing? Why can't we get a direct connection to that data source? Why can't we um, change how people even think about their money, right? Like, let's go do that. Um, and so as a result, it's been great. And we have all the guardrails in place and we continue to build them as needed around regulation and all that. And, you know, you have to be astute and aware of that. Um, but other than that, I think it's pretty similar uh, to consumer. Yeah, for me, there's a couple of things that stand out. Um, so I was in FinTech once before. Uh, the way I got to the Bay Area, I was in a FinTech startup in Pittsburgh, CMU spinoff, and we got bought in the first dot-com boom. And so we got moved out, we got bought by Intuit. So we got moved out here um, and kept doing what we were doing, but inside of the context of Intuit. Um, and the ecosystem back then, the technical ecosystem, was completely fundamentally broken. Um, it's still kind of broken, but it's evolved so much that the opportunity to do things now is actually possible. Whereas back then, there were literally things you couldn't do because you just did not have access. It was really hard. And now the thing that's really fundamentally different from then is that not only do you have access, but people's behaviors have changed. The first time I, I tried to do FinTech, people wouldn't link an account. They wouldn't tell you their actual name. They wouldn't log in with a real credential. None of that was possible because people just hadn't gotten used to that yet. And so now they do, so you have that opportunity. The other big difference from other consumer tech, I've done a lot of different kinds of, of consumer tech, is that the ecosystem that we exist in, you have, to, you have to work with that. A lot of other consumer tech, they can just do their thing in their bubble, building the stuff they feel like building, and then it's, the thing that's just directly relevant to what they're doing. Whereas with FinTech, you also have to navigate all the ecosystem that you're inside of and figure out who you can work with, who does a good job, who does a bad job, how you partner with them, how they partner with you at a technical level, not just at a business level. And so that is quite different from most consumer uh, internet companies, for lack of a better uh, phrase. A lot of them just get to build what they want to build. Um, they build it based on the technology that they understand and the opportunity that they see in front of them. And they don't have to navigate all that other stuff, which does make it trickier. It doesn't change the way you build consumer software. You still do all the normal stuff you would expect. You test and learn and iterate and test and learn and iterate. And you do market research and you understand your customer and you figure out what they need, what jobs do they need you to do for them. And then you provide that. But providing that's a little bit trickier in FinTech because you've got this whole ecosystem you have to exist in. There's also all the legal stuff and regulatory stuff and things like that. Um, there's not a lot of regulation around, say, I, I worked in online music. There wasn't a lot of regulation in that. There was a little bit of um, industry stuff that got in the way, and they, the industry created regulation, but it didn't exist from the start, and so that was a little bit easier there. But the fundamental thing is the ecosystem is just trickier. Um, so going a little deeper on the regulation topic, how has regulation created a lot of overhead for smaller, earlier stage companies like Digit? Yeah, we actually take a, uh, like a forward leaning approach on this. And so we're not a financial institution. We're not a money transmitter. These are all kind of like legal terms that you might, you might hear when you talk about FinTech. Um, we've actually instituted a series of policies around um, anti-money laundering and information security to make sure that we're at the level where if we ever were to be regulated, we'd already be in compliance. And we've done that to take a leadership position. And ultimately it's actually not dissimilar from building the type of culture you want to build and so we actually, look, I look at this a lot as we kind of train our organization around these things is what kind of culture do we want to build, right? We want to build one that's upstanding, that's honest. One of our core values is build trust. Um, and so the regulation creates a little overhead here and there, 
Um, and obviously as we do things, we, you know, we check with the lawyers, make sure we can do things the way we were supposed to, but I don't think it's slowed us down. If anything, it's made us stronger because you get a more clear understanding and our culture is we want everyone to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it versus like, hey, here's the thing you can't do and here's the thing that you can do. Um, and so as a result, I think it's actually helped up our game. Um, and I think if you approach it from that proactive nature, you're able to work around it. Um, we've actually had more pain from things like TCPA where you can't text users and Digit was actually initially an SMS chatbot. So making sure you get double opt-in, like that's actually been more, that type of stuff has been more painful for us than financial regulations around what we can and can't do. Of course, the technical side of getting access to data and information, that's always a challenge. But regulation has actually, I think, been a net value add in the end. Um, that being said, I joined a little over a year ago and so a lot of this stuff was in place at the base level before I got there. <laughs> and what about for mid to later stage companies like a firm or nerd wallet? I think the same sort of thing, the bigger we get, the more I think in our face the, the regulation becomes, and especially in light of this administration and whatever may change over the next few years, I think there's a lot that we still don't know. Um, but I think for instance, as a lender, uh, we view things as, such as this proposed cap on interest rates for credit card companies and lenders as probably an overall net positive for us because we think that is a way of leveling the playing field. Um, you know, interest rates are, are, and fees are generally what credit card companies make all their money on anyway. We, we play a little bit of a different game. So I think, to, to Vicious' point, I think being proactive as we have been, uh, we have people that spend time in Washington uh, so that we have an ear to the ground on what policy may come has been helpful. But oh, I think same thing. Overall, it's been a net sort of positive thing for the company. Uh, just to, to build on that for a second, we, we see the same thing. We actually, again, consumer first, we view most regulation as trying to benefit consumers. It doesn't always, but that's what it's attempting to do. And we, we, we try to lean into that and try to make sure that it's actually doing that. We're not trying to work our way around it or play games with it or anything. Very similar to Digit, we, we want to be ready for regulation when we need it. We are also not a financial institution. But we expect that someday we're going to be regulated in those various ways. The things that really cause overhead for us or other kinds of uh, regulation, similarly. CCPA, um, California Consumer Privacy Act. For people who maybe are familiar with GDPR, which was the European privacy laws last year, this is sort of California's version of that. Um, that's actually more uh, sort of overhead or work for us than um, any of the like normal sort of financial regulation. And that's mostly because it tends to be stuff that springs out at you. Like it just comes out of nowhere. Like California's like, okay, we've decided to do this now. And oh, by the way, you have to be compliant by January. Um, good luck. And it's not quite as easy as like uh, working with regulators who have been around for a long time. Our CEO sits on some regulatory boards and tries to influence regulation just like, like all the other companies up here. That's normal. But this other stuff just comes at you and you're like, oh, okay, we're gonna disrupt everything we were doing to do that instead. That's actually where most of the regulatory kind of pain comes in. It's not financial. Have we seen regulation kind of spur different collaborations or partnerships between traditional financial institutions and startups and fintech? Yeah, I think we may get into it later, but our work with Walmart brought me down a pretty interesting legal rat hole. I wish I had my JD. Um, but one thing, Walmart kind of serves millions and millions and millions of customers every day. So with that scale and the number of locations they have around the country, they figure everybody's spending their money at Walmart. Why wouldn't we just provide financial services as well? Uh, so they many times early 2000s sought to um, basically file for an industrial lending charter, which would allow them to buy a bank and kind of make a step toward, you know, building a Walmart financial services on top of it or alongside of their, their retail operation. Um, but you can imagine there's a whole lot of competitive backlash. They figured if there's a Walmart bank, every community bank in the country would be put out of business. You guys have the scale to offer the best sort of rates and things like that. So Walmart basically was forced by this regulation to shift its policy away from buying a bank. How else can we provide financial services? Well, we're going to do it through partnerships. Um, and they do. I mean, if you look on their website, it's kind of interesting how they're like, okay, you're not gonna let me buy it. I'm gonna offer every single possible financial product out there uh, through a network of partnerships and a firm is one of them. So I think while that is a different sort of a regulation, probably more on you know, large scale monopoly sort of things and, and retail, uh, it has opened the door for companies like a firm to, to kind of work alongside them too. And how did you, did you feel like there was a disparity in leverage when we, you're working with such big clients like 
Walmart and how did, how did you navigate that? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, these, they are the biggest company in the world by revenue, I believe. Um, and yeah, they're very, very difficult to work with. You have absolutely no leverage in those conversations. However, uh, you do have something that they want and you'd have something their customers want and frankly their employees want of which they have two and a half million, right? So if we are able to offer a, um, you know, a financial product for their customers that they need in the store, um, you know, that's why we have a seat at the table. I think that navigating that is, is sort of just, you kind of have to play by their rules, but also know where you do have leverage and that's the ability to move quickly, to be agile. Uh, even some of their other bank partners, financial services partners they have like formerly American Express and Synchrony Bank, they just cannot do the things that, that we can do given how small and uh, how talented our engineering team uh, is. So I think it, it's been an interesting kind of road with them, but ultimately at the end of the day, say what you will about a Walmart, they do care a whole lot about their customers. And I think the, the mission, the brand is very well aligned with the firm. We actually see very similar stuff working with all of the banks, investment firms, et cetera. They're, they're gigantic and they, they control the system in a lot of ways. But they, to your point, they really do have a need for us. And so leaning into the need that they have without like divorcing yourself from the consumer, providing important stuff to the consumer such that they don't have another easy alternative to that is what tends to make them negotiate rather just to dictate terms. And you just build those relationships over time. You build that customer relationship that you need to have with your own consumers. And you just make sure that that, um, that sort of glue between them is, is very sticky. So they need you to be there because then they will negotiate back. If it's not, then you have a harder time. Um, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. Right, and Digit and Nerdwall and Affirm all growing very, very quickly. How do you prevent startups from facing kind of the same um, friction points and the same problems as you're growing and scaling? Same, same as what? Same as the larger companies. I think, I think ultimately probably comes down to culture more than anything else. Um, and we've had some very strong what not to do's within financial services the last few years, whether it's the Capital One breach or Wells Fargo stealing from everybody. I think it, it's easy for, I won't say it's easy, but it, it is, it's a constant reminder of how important our brand is we you know, very much pride ourselves in our NPS net promoter score. For those that don't know, that means uh, ours is 83, I think, which means 83% of people that use a firm are more likely to recommend it to, to a friend or a peer. Um, most banks, I was even looking at this earlier this week, are negative, meaning if you use, PNC, by the way, is 15. Uh, so they've got a lot to do, a lot of work to do there. Um, that means only you know, 15 people would actually recommend it. So I think holding ourselves to, to that higher standard um, it's kind of a good reflection in, in how our brand is perceived. But I think also culturally, uh, that's why we don't do late fees. That's why we don't have these like hidden interest, all these other kind of gimmicks that banks have because it just begets bad behavior and it becomes culturally sort of instilled uh, you know, in those brands. So I don't know, we'll, we'll see obviously over time, but it is something that you don't see it in this room, but we have our values all over the place. People come first, um, no fine print, transparency, that kind of stuff is, is everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to like unpack what banks are, right? Uh, I'm not a huge fan of like the boogeyman. I prefer to focus on the customer versus the competitor. Uh, but like, what are banks? Banks are a place where they amass deposits in order to use them for lending. And historically, the bank takes deposits from customers, lends back to customers, right? Every big bank today does a bunch of other stuff with your money. And what they want is a deposit base. And so all of a sudden their customers are actually not consumers, they actually serve consumers kind of because they have to, because they need the deposit base to go do all their other activities. And so not, you know, a little bit by chance, like where we're going is we're trying to help consumers uh, make progress in their financial lives. And that's the thing that's really hard to do. Um, banks offer credit cards that are actually fairly complex, you know, financial instruments um, with a really simple UI. And as a result, people end up in debt. So the way we avoid those pitfalls is we align ourselves very closely with our customer. Um, we made a decision a long time ago to be a subscription-based service. We don't make money off of fees, off of other, issue, other areas, interest, things like that. We focus on you're a member of Digit, you pay us a monthly fee, we drive your financial health up into the right, 
And if we can do that effectively and you can feel the value, then you'll keep subscribing. And if you can't, you're going to leave. Um, and that mentality, I think, helps us avoid some of the pitfalls and builds the culture of, you know, we have one customer. We don't sell ads. We don't sell your data. We don't take your deposits and, you know, go, you know, lend it out or take other activities against it. So as a result, we're very well aligned with the customer. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. So building trust is huge. The other thing I would mention there is startups have a huge advantage because they don't have all that history. And the history um, makes it really hard for a bank, for example, to be nimble. It's really hard for them to address the customer need because to change their entire system to address a customer need that's emerged in the modern world, it's, it's non-trivial. There's just a huge amount of work. They've got all these sunk costs and systems that have been built over you know, anywhere between 10 and uh, 100 years, depending on the bank. And different, different um, financial institutions, that's not just picking on banks, but different financial institutions have a very different view of how they approach customers. Some are very customer centric, some are not. Some they really think of other businesses as the customer and as consumers as a, a source of, of deposits really. So it's different, it's different across the whole ecosystem. But if you had all that legacy, all that um, history, it's really hard to undo that. And so from a technical perspective, which is spent a fair amount of my time looking at that, they have a harder problem than any startup. Startups get that clean slate where they can just sort of build something new and come into that ecosystem as opposed to having lived in the ecosystem for, or even created the ecosystem over the last couple hundred years that financial institutions have existed. Just, just to build on that, it, it recalled a story um, that Max told us at one point, I, I can't remember exactly which bank, but it's exactly what, what you're mentioning, David. He spoke the CEO of a, private label credit card issuer, like you'd get the Best Buy card or the J. Crew card or something. And those cards traditionally have the highest APR. They traditionally are sought out by and approve the deepest, uh, lowest FICO score customer. And they also employ something called deferred interest, which means like you might get a promotional, no interest if you pay it off in six months, but oh, by the way, if you don't, you're gonna get backdated daily compounded interest at 30%, it's a massive problem. So I remember he asked this, woman, I believe it was the CEO, like, why? This is so obviously bad. <laughs> why do you keep doing it? And they're like, we can't change it. Our entire business model is built on that. It is a income and revenue driver that we share with our partners. Like, it is literally in the fabric of our business. We cannot undo it. So I think to your point, like, these things are relatively systemic. So with all the startups, I think the ecosystem, the financial ecosystem, we're now in a state where financial services are a lot more accessible. People can move money, invest in stocks, manage their personal finances on their phone, like anywhere, anytime. But the average American household is still around tens of thousands in credit card debt. So what do we think is missing? Um, so this is gonna sound stupid, but uh, income. Um, people, and, and, and more than just income, but pe people also, they need to know how to manage their money better. Like not, not everybody who is, is struggling is struggling because of their own decisions or anything, they just are struggling. And so they have debt that they have because they wanna have a life and have a lifestyle. They also need advice, they need guidance, they need the ability to save easily when they don't think they can. They need the ability to, to make progress more than anything else. Like making progress is really hard for a lot of people. We're in the Bay Area. We live in a very, very special bubble. Um, the rest of the, the world and even large chunks of the United States don't. And they're just, they have a different problem set. Their problem set is really living paycheck to paycheck. We know how many people live paycheck to paycheck. We know that most people can't handle a $400 unexpected expense. That's, they don't have the tools. They don't have the capability. They don't even think about it right. How many people learned about this in high school? And raise your hand if you learned about it in high school. Yeah, exactly, one. <laughs> Um, that's one more than I expected, actually. They don't teach this stuff. Um, so literally, well, they don't. They don't teach this stuff. So people don't know. They're ignorant. And ignorance is, um, there's an asymmetric uh, information problem there. They don't know, and other companies know. And so they wind up in these fabric of the system situations where what they're doing is just built on that. And what a lot of companies like us do is we, we shift that balance. Maybe just a little bit, but that's the fundamental thing, in my opinion. Like income is it's a, it's a joke answer, but it's actually part of the problem. And then once you have income, how do you manage it is the next part of the problem. Yeah, I think you know, income is definitely a huge part of it. But one of the things that actually holds back income growth is the financial stresses that you have in your life. Um, and I probably, we probably come out philosophically on a slightly different part 
of the spectrum than where NerdWallet is, right? NerdWallet's out there giving great advice for folks that have the interest, the aptitude, or the diligence to go take it and do something with it, right? We are actually on the automation side. And so, like I said, people said they couldn't save, they used to use Digit, Digit saves for them. And so the analogy I often use is, you know, five years ago, you're probably imagining talking to a friend that's like, I don't like to use Google Maps. I like to know how to get from A to B and see all the signposts and understand what's going on. Today, that same friend is on Google Maps no matter what and doesn't think twice about the route she takes from you know, downtown to the Presidio, for example, right? Um, and we think Digit's on the forefront of that. We think there's actually a ton of automation that reduces a lot of the burden because A, it impacts your diligence. A computer's gonna make better decisions for you on a regular basis, especially if there's a very simple undo button um, if you need to make a change, right? On aptitude. A computer's gonna know on any given day what the better decision is to make than you are and can recommend the right things for you. You can then plug in at that leverage point and make a decision. Um, and so I think there's really interesting like parts here where Digi can automate away all of this. And I actually come down on the other end of kind of advice, which is you go to the gym, you get a trainer, you get better exercising, right? The trainer goes away, you're probably not gonna be doing all the same exercises in the rep. So you actually need that help. And what Digi's gonna do is we're gonna automate that for you and we're gonna make that work for you really simply. And I think that's where actually a lot of people fall short. And what we found is people actually dig themselves out of this hole very effectively using Digi. Our internal studies have shown that people go from kind of what we call financially unhealthy, $600 or less of uh, saving, checking plus savings combined to over $1,200, which we call financially coping, not quite financially healthy, in 12 months of using Digi, right? And so I think a big gap of this is actually building the tools to help people be better, give them the superpower, and at the same time, get them out of the, you know, the system that is also incentive to make, help them make a lot of bad decisions. Yeah, I think the, the consumer debt, so non-mortgage consumer debt in the country is around 4.07 or something trillion dollars. I think it's the highest it's been since 2008. Uh, of that, a little over 1 trillion is credit card debt. Uh, the rest is auto and, um, and student loans, right? So I know I'm still paying my student loans as well. But I think on the, on the credit card side of things, I think that's where when we think of developing products, it's a challenge that we, we kind of lay out internally is let's just make sure it doesn't only work in the coastal cities, right? Does it work in middle America? Uh, generally, not really, not really as well as it does in, you know, New York, LA, San Francisco, Boston. Um, and that's mostly because of trust, right? People do not trust the, because you're seeing data breaches every day and they're like, well, tech companies get asked for my information. I've never heard of them. Um, my mom's a good example of this. Uh, it was from Pittsburgh, but I think figuring out a way to bridge that gap and start to build trust with the people that need it most is, is probably the most important thing because otherwise they don't have an alternative. In, in our case, um, you know, it's either a firm or a credit card or a payday loan for a lot of people and they can't get a credit card sometimes. So um, uh, finding a way for them to start to not only understand what's available and of course that comes through education, but building some more trust through new tech products too. Um, so you mentioned your mom it doesn't really trust these um, kind of new, newer financial technologies. Um, so along the lines, kind of the gap between the newer millennial generation versus kind of the baby boomers, um, what, are, what are some differences in their spending behavior when they were the same age? Yeah, sure. So um, there's a couple of things that really stand out. One is student loans, to, to your point, Chris. Um, it's astonishing how much people have to pay in student loans now versus 20 or 30 years ago. Um, experiences versus stuff is something that's definitely emerging. It used to be that people just wanted to buy more things. Now they want to have better experiences. Um, and that, we see that particularly in cities like San Francisco. There's a lot of that. And then um, they're not buying houses as much. They've shifted away from buying houses. There's a lot less interest in owning a home than there used to be. Owning a home used to be this like magical goal. Now it's just something you do if, you, if it makes sense. It's not nearly as, as significant. So they've shifted quite a bit in, in those behaviors. I think I totally agree. I, I'd add that there's far beyond you know, these three companies, the trend of um, monthly payments and subscriptions, right? So whether that is, I don't wanna buy a car because I'm gonna Uber everywhere. Um, I wanna, don't wanna get, buy groceries, I'm gonna get you know, meal, meal plans sent to the house or something. I think that's a pretty interesting trend among you know, the millennial generation that just didn't exist before. Again, I think it has a lot to do with our, I'm a millennial, like our willingness to trust based on very little, like getting somebody else's car and 
It's kind of odd, um, but not really. So I think that, that, that desire to pay a monthly service fee kind of pervades a lot of industries. And of course, that's a lot of what a firm is trying to tap into as well. Instead of spending, you know, a thousand bucks, break it up over a year and, you know, you'll treat it just like rent. Um, so overall, the shift from owning to renting and, and service model is, is interesting. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about some things more on the technical side. So fraud is one of like the major vulnerabilities that a consumer will face and it's ever changing. So how does, how do fintech companies detect fraud and protect their customers? Uh, so I can start with that. So first, yes, absolutely. Huge problem. Uh, we have a whole team that is focused on security and fraud and they spend all of their time paying attention to, to the world what's going on out there, what are bad actors doing, what are they trying to do, how are they trying to break in. And also we just, we build our software so that it's monitorable, so that we can see what's going on, so that we can audit it, so that when something happens, we know what happened. You know, we're very careful with the privacy side of that, but with, the, with like de-identified data, we can see lots and lots and lots of patterns. There are also lots of companies emerging, which will help you do this. There's lots of services out there, which you can tap into, who see the whole internet, not just our little slice of it, and they can, they can detect patterns that we would never see. And so we employ those services, we build them into our software, we monitor it closely, and we have a team of people who manage it directly from a technical point of view. We also have the non-technical side where we know how we're gonna respond to fraud when it occurs, because it is inevitable. Something will go wrong. We can't be perfect, it's an arms race. Sometimes they win, sometimes we win, it goes back and forth constantly. Um, pretty much any FinTech company out there, almost any company out there of any note, is being attacked constantly in one way, shape, or form. Some know it, some don't. If you know it, you can pay attention to it, and the big uh, service companies that are helping can really see those patterns and help you out. And then the real question isn't, how do you see it? It's what do you do about it? So there's defensive things you do on the building of your product. You, everybody's familiar with two-factor authentication, for example. Um, yeah, it's annoying. It's also fairly effective. So um, making sure that your product does that in the right ways, making sure that, um, you understand just the technical landscape that's going on so that the simple things don't, don't come up and, and harm you. There's a lot of simple stuff you can do in product design so that you look authentic, so that you are who you are and they know that they're not being fished, for example, or, or all the you know, thousands of things that can go wrong out there. So just building your product right, taking security into account or, or fraud or all of the above actually up front, detecting it throughout your systems, managing it internally because a big vector for uh, fraud is employees inside of companies. So making sure you have the controls in place around say data access to personal information so people can't abuse that. Um, managing things when people leave so that they can't take the information they had that shouldn't have been shared outside with them. All of that, you just have to do all of the above. And you just have to be diligent about it and focus on it and make it a discipline within your organization. It should be part of the culture. Everybody should be thinking about it. It should be on your mind if you're in a financial institution of any sort. If it's not, the last thing I'll call out there is, is social engineering is actually one of the biggest ones. Calling up and saying, hey, I'm so-and-so, and can you tell me X? Tell me your password, tell me your social security number. Um, people say, people answer that. It happened to my parents, to bring up our parents. My, my, my dad gave them his social security number, his bank account numbers, and all this stuff, and he's like, wait, my son told me not to do this, and he hung up on them. <laughs> but not before, not before they had his social security number, his bank account, and all of that. All of that you have to take into account. You just, it's, it's just part of what we do. Um, it's not regulation, it's just the right thing and you have to do it for your consumers. And then a question for you, Chris. How does lending at the point of sale work? How is a firm able to underwrite someone in a matter of minutes? Yeah, I mean, it's related to the, to the fraud question. Um, so what we do is when we, we partner with a merchant, we're guaranteeing them two things. Uh, first, that any loss due to fraud, we eat that cost, we cover that. So it's, it's kind of an insurance policy there. And of course, we control the underwriting, which is just the way of saying, how do we assess and evaluate risk to approve, approve customers? Um, so in the application process for a firm, again, one of our values juxtaposed against a credit card is our application is actually very short. Instead of like a page long, uh, if not longer application process, it's fairly invasive in the information that it, it requests. Um, we ask for your name, phone number, email, birthday, and last four of your social. And with that information, we not only run that through our, our credit um, underwriting model, which will reference your FICO score, but another thing that we try to do is we have our own, uh, our own model based on machine learning that is saying, 
And I remember very early on when I joined a little over four years ago, um, both with our fraud and our credit model, the idea like how we built those is by losing money and identifying patterns and basically giving money away, knowing that we're trying to see, okay, this person looked like this, they had attributes like this and they were fraudulent. So let's build it back in the model and away you go. So on both fraud and, and the risk side, that's, that's kind of how our models were built. Um, but with that information, we, we kind of run it through both those models. In some cases, we might ask for, um, you know, know your customer or any kind of like uh, ID validation on your, on your phone or on your, on your um, mobile browser, um, and then we approve them. So it's pretty quick. Uh, it should be seconds instead of minutes for the most part, but it depends. Um, but it's, it's pretty amazing. Very cool. Um, I want to wrap up our panel with one last question. So for aspiring entrepreneurs in the audience, what is one piece of advice that you'd give them if they want to start their own business in the fintech space? I can start with that. Um, I would say find a real consumer pain point, a real need that they have, and solve it for them. Find a way to solve it, test it with them, work with them closely, and really prove out that you've, you're solving a, a real problem, not one that you've imagined or one that is driven by, say, technology. There's a lot of technologies looking for problems to solve. Don't start there. Start the other way around. Look for the problem that's really causing somebody real pain and make that pain go away because they will talk about you, they will market for you, they will love your product to death because you made something good happen for them. So find that problem and, and fix it. Um, I would say go do it, right? Like I'll, I, I have so many conversations with folks like, oh, I'm thinking about this, I'm kind of hanging on to this job or I haven't quite found the right thing or whatever. It's like, if you, and you can feel this, I think, right? If you have a strong idea and a passion that you want to pursue and you don't think anyone else is doing it the right way and Ideally, you have a co-founder, even if you don't, I think that's okay. It's like, go do it. Um, I often think about like, what's the worst thing that can happen in a scenario? And then I go up from there. And so when I uh, left my job to start my first startup, uh, FanVibe, um, back in, I don't know, it was like 2009 or something like that. I was like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, the worst thing that can happen is we work on this. It doesn't really go anywhere. I lose a year of salary and, you know, I go get a regular job. More likely scenario, and actually what happened was we worked on it, we got to you know, 100,000 users, didn't see a path forward, ended up getting acquired, right? And basically you get paid in equity and cash for like basically the salary you lost. So there was really no downside, um, certainly in a downstream, like, you know, in a down environment, like it can be challenging, but if you're talented, you believe you have a problem, go, you have a problem to solve rather, go do it. Stop like, stop dilly-dallying. And if you can't get to that point, then stop talking about it, Put your head down, go find a problem, and then go, go do it then. I am not an entrepreneur, so I you know, take my advice with a grain of salt. But I think to build on, on David, one of the points he made earlier, specifically in fintech. So my, when I was in consulting before, I was in the defense industry. So private sector defense, highly regulated, uh, obviously. And I, I view there's similarities between defense, fintech, or financial services, and even healthcare, in where they are so heavily regulated that there is this like complexity arbitrage where people are intimidated by the industry because it's really hard to understand, intentionally so, by incumbents. Um, so my advice, and, and something I, 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 along with a lot of my colleagues in the room here, uh, in my time at a firm, have focused on is understanding the ecosystem. Because if you're going to do, do anything, lending, credit cards, financial service, anything within in fintech, you must partner with um, whether it's networks or anything, right? You have to understand how all these things uh, come together work together, otherwise you're kind of flying blind. So my advice is how to obsessively study the industry and, and you know, disambiguate to the extent as possible. Perfect, well thank you all for sharing your experiences. I wanna open it up to the audience for questions. No planted questions. <laughs> I heard they're out there. Hey, my name is Michelle, thank you for being here. Um, since I went to CMU, the computational finance program too, I studied a lot of pricing. So my question here for you is about the pricing. I think a couple of you mentioned that FinTech are very different uh, than traditional banking. Uh, you know, traditional banks take deposit from consumers then lend it back to consumers. The advantage of doing that is obviously deposit, especially checking deposits, basically free. So how FinTech since doesn't take deposit, how do you make your pricing competitive compared to traditional banking? 
Um, I don't think our goal is to make be competitive with existing banking. Like I think banking margins, you know, writ large are fat. Are they are you know they lack trust. They make money off fees, off interest, off a bunch of other things that you know I think frankly they've done just to profit optimize. And so I think what we're looking to do is build a business that is aligned with our consumer. It will be a big business, but we don't need to be a bank. And in the process, if we destroy a bank, that's fine. Um, but our goal is to build a big business that serves our consumers. And I think that's its own revenue model and that has its own comps and that's valued differently. And frankly, banks with, a, with the consumer deposits, they're doing a lot of other stuff other, rather than just lending it back to consumers, right? They're putting it out of the market. I mean, you read about 2008, there's a bunch, bunch of issues here, right? Um, and so um, we're not trying to make banking margins. We're not trying to make banking revenues. We're trying to make consumer revenues that are fair, that make sense, provide an exceptional value in our bundle for a fair price. Okay, thank you for the sharing. So today we're talking about entrepreneur uh, fintech, and uh, David earlier mentioned the uh, entrepreneur saw the pain point, right? So um, my question is regarding the payment. Uh, so uh, right now we're still carrying checkbook, make payment, and um, do a lot of things for long, long history. And uh, probably you, we have traveling other country to Asia, people using barcode to make all kind of payment. And so what's your, you know, what's your see why still ch using check a lot and what's the possible path to possible better payment system? Yeah, I th so in my current capacity evaluating how we expand internationally and to the point on the need to exist within the infrastructure, the ecosystem that, that any one country has. I think we think about this question a lot. Um, for instance, why and when will things like Apple Pay or NFC or QR codes or et cetera actually become uh, the standard versus um, what they are right now, which is not a whole lot of penetration other than sort of like convenience, everyday, everyday spend. Uh, I, it seems like whether it's uh, Alipay or Tencent, some of them, they have leapfrogged technology in their own market where, um, or they have just disabled the use of any other technology in that market, therefore they don't give a whole lot of other choice. Um, that seems to be some of the trend, but I think w at a firm at least, we think of ourselves different from like a checkbook or debit card or credit card even because we are, we're basically lending 500 to $5,000 loans that people, there's a, lo there's a high, lower barrier to using a less convenient form of payment. And that's why we have things on mobile phone because there's a need there versus just convenient swiping a debit card. Um, but it's a fascinating you know, question. And same thing with, with Walmart. They too are trying to develop their own payment network so they don't pay credit card fees. Um, but the adoption there has been fairly low. So I can't really answer it or, or kind of give it a definitive answer other than providing some context how we think about it. I can add a little bit to that. Um, an another part of the problem, this is actually a place where governments can be super helpful. So for example, in India, they've basically mandated by government fiat that they will have to have a good payment system. And if you go and you look at say the startup space in India, for example, everything is mobile payment, everything. And it has taken off, especially with the uh, millennial folks. It's just, because they, they created a, a situation where it had to. Likewise, if you look at, at Europe, they're pushing on open banking. The same thing. They're really trying to set up a new ecosystem so that it can work better. And so they can actually allow companies like the fintech companies we see here to, to operate better. In the United States, most of that's driven by companies and the free market. And so you have a mass confusion over which system to bet on. So everyone's making different bets. And that makes it inconvenient. When it's inconvenient, people don't do it. It, it causes pain, it doesn't remove pain. Do I use Apple Pay here or Samsung Pay there or Google Pay here or, uh, you know, my, or my credit card? Uh, can I automate that that I not automate? James is talking. Is that again? Yeah. And he's out. But anyway, it's, if, if you make things convenient and you make it possible, it's a lot easier. If you don't, it's not. And I would argue at least, Mostly the United States companies have a real problem. Test. 
Hey, thank you so much for uh, speaking today. It's been very uh, informative. Uh, my question is kind of uh, based off partnerships. So it seems like the, the way to grow fintech is through partnerships. How, what kind of KPIs or metrics are you using to find partners and to vet them? And what's, what, how do you uh, like judge whether a future partnership will be beneficial? For NerdWallet, that's actually pretty easy since we're, we're after being comprehensive we really are looking at the, the number of partners and sort of their penetration into the consumer market that we serve. And so we care a lot about those partners being part of, part of the useful to the people that we are trying to serve so that that partnership can be beneficial both to the consumer and to the company. So we really start with what, what again, what the consumers need. And we look at the partnerships that will, will allow us to do that. And then we, we go after those. We're not always successful, of course, because you know, there's different uh, economics for different partners and stuff like that. But the core is what do people need? Uh, so we, we think of maybe partnerships in two buckets. Um, there's the merchant partners with whom we basically our sales scene goes out to integrate a firm as a payment method, all that sort of thing. The reason we do that um, or the, the, the KPIs that we care about there for the company is the amount of loan volume we generate. So what percent of Walmart sales can we, when, can we capture? Uh, as well as a number of uh, customers that we acquire and hopefully you can have recurring uh, interactions with going forward. So that's kind of how we evaluate a, the value of a merchant partnership. I'd say secondary to that, but also very important is the credit quality that that merchant partner may attract. Uh, you can think of like we work with Casper and Peloton, some very um, millennial oriented brands that might attract a, a higher quality uh, credit demographic than others. The other bucket of partnerships are those getting back this ecosystem point with whom we must partner in order to build and offer new products. So I can consider these more product partnerships. Those are less KPI oriented than they are. How can we do something with Visa because we have to do something with Visa in order to scale our business. Uh, and I think it ends up being more an evaluation of like what capabilities do they have um, that kind of makes sense for, for our product roadmap. roadmap. Uh, great sharing. Um, I'm a big fan of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Uh, probably there are some fans here as well in the audience. So uh, my question to you is, do you think cryptocurrency will go to mainstream? And are you guys looking into providing like cryptocurrency based financial products or services? Thank you. I don't know. I'm gonna... <laughs> Um, I'm not going to comment on whether or not it's going to work or not and become part of the ecosystem as such. We are certainly paying close attention to it, but for us, most of the customers that we serve have zero interest in it. And so there's not a lot of uh, need for us to, to do anything with it right now. We pay attention to it because it is definitely a disruptive force in the world today. And it may or may not wind up working out that way, but it's certainly trying. And if it succeeds, it will be, it will be a game changer in many different ways. But today, from a customer perspective, um, that's a bubble problem. We live in the bubble where people are paying attention to crypto for the most part. And it, when you get outside of this bubble, it's just not on their minds. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I think that um, you know, we're definitely in a watch and see mode, but I view that as kind of any other you know, big strategic thing out there is like when we feel like that's tipping and we get the data that says that, you know, we'll obviously support what we need to support. Um, there's a long way to go um, and changing, you know, we talk about changing payment systems, changing uh, to crypto, you know, certainly will take, will take a while. That being said, you know, obviously growing and obviously there's a good traction on, on blockchain in general. I will add one thing. I think that as we think about um, scaling our business internationally or otherwise, one of the more perhaps interesting use cases for crypto is cross-border transfer. Uh, so how can you enable the millions of people, especially in the United States, that need to send money home to Mexico or, or Latin America? And there's a whole lot of money that's going through. Um, that is, has a fairly steep fee associated with it, and this is a lower cost way of doing it. So insofar as it is a thing and it's something that would be sort of accretive to our product portfolio and mission, then I think something like that makes a lot of sense. Hi, uh, great talk. I'm, I'm, I'm the audience plant, just in case I wasn't clear with all the hand waving. Um, but we talked a little bit about brand earlier, and I'm, I'm wondering, and this is a question for all three of you, since I think you three are all at different sizes of growth. Um, what is the role of brand in consumer fintech, especially in the next two years? And I mean, to take a real world example, you have something like the Apple card, which arguably does not offer great 
you know, benefits, but with such a powerful brand, is that enough to disrupt the space? I mean, I think you nailed it right there in terms of like, what's the definition of a brand, right? A brand is permission, right? It gives you the right to continue to offer your products and new and evolved products to your customer base, whether that's in line with what you've done before or something different. It's actually something we talked a lot about when I used to work at ESPN of like, what is a brand permission of ESPN and how far can you push that? Um, and if you read kind of the history of ESPN, potentially they pushed it too far and now they've kind of dialed it back a little bit. And so kind of the corollary to that is like, how do you build the brand, right? Um, and it's probably like two different ways to do it. There are companies that are invested in building their brand and then hoping that that brand sells financial products. Um, and that's actually, startups have adopted that. Um, I won't name names, but it is actually someone in an antiquated strategy that, you know, a Charles Schwab did and, you know, maybe E-Trade did. Um, the other approach is build the product that your customers love, um, have them spread the word, have your design and your UX and your benefits to your customers become your brand. And then once you've established that, promote that. Um, some of a corollary to my time at Yelp, small business owners don't necessarily love Yelp because you, cannot, you, you can no longer live in a world where you just advertise and people show up, right? You build a brand on the back of your great restaurant or your great services electrician, and then you can pay to promote that brand on Yelp and in other places, and then that's how you get the maximum reward. And I think that's the, that's the brand building approach that Digit's taking, which is build the product for the customer that they love, prove the impact, use your product focus and your design and your UX to build that brand. And then eventually at the appropriate time, we will spend more on promoting that brand, which will give us permission to then obviously launch and build and uh, deploy new products. I think just to add it on a lot of the same sort of concepts with the firm, one of the coolest things about my time here is seeing these different iterations we've gone through building brand. I remember even sitting down with the guy that designed our newest logo in New York, very eccentric kind of dude, but it was interesting to hear like, how do you distill the values that we espouse into symbols, into colors and, and all that sort of stuff is, is very cool. And, and I don't think we've quite nailed it. We've, we've gotten pretty big strides. The other tension that we have though, is that we're a B to B to C company. So the decision and timing of um, when we start to build and do direct consumer marketing, where we're really focused on our brand, which is very expensive um, versus just having what the, the model is basically based on is if we can provide value to a merchant and their consumer, then that merchant should promote our brand for us, right? Because there's, there's something in it for them. So I think the, the way that we acquired customers, the way that we built brand was sort of on the backs of our merchant base for the, for the most part, but we've since shifted. Um, and I think lastly, it's just how do our values actually show up in our product? Uh, and for a firm, it's transparency is very important. So we're very transparent, fully transparent on the cost upfront. So you'll know exactly what your interest would be for, for any given loan. Uh, we don't do late fees. So it's all that sort of stuff, which we view as our brand more than just the logo and colors. Um, but we think it's kind of going to be essential to acquiring and retaining any user. Yeah. So if, if I understand your question, you really asked how important is brand? So another way to think of brand is it's a signal. It's a signal to people who like that brand that they like it for some reason, that they, it writes as a reminder. Um, why would someone want an Apple credit card, for example? It's because they trust Apple. They trust the brand. Apple has spent decades trying to build up a brand that people trust and believe in. And they've positioned themselves. They've used their values. They've, they've, they've gotten permission. They've done all of that so that they can then get the trust of the customer. So the customer comes back and comes back and comes back because it's Apple. Apple's credit card is not unique. Um, it's got some interesting features, but it's not really particularly unique. But they trust Apple. And so I do think that Apple, that's an interesting play for Apple. It gives them a, an interesting position that they didn't have before. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that we have consumer trust as well. I think we all do. I think that's one of our core things up here. Um, without trust, finance doesn't work. <laughs> Literally, if you read the history of finance without trust, I give you a piece of paper and you say, oh, cool, here, here's, here's a chair. Um, that's kind of weird. Um, it doesn't make sense unless everybody trusts everybody. There's a lot of um, research on trust. A lot of books, a lot of security books actually, because most trust is actually, most security is actually trust, not actual security. Um, if, you, if you don't have a brand that people trust, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna do things with you. They're not gonna trust you. They're not gonna give you their money. They're certainly not gonna take your advice. So there's a lot of different ways to look at brand, but brand is absolutely critical to a financial institution because if you don't trust them, you've got a problem. Why do you think Wells Fargo spent so much time doing damage control? Um, because they made a mistake and it damaged their brand very deeply. And they're working on fixing that and they appear to be taking that very, very seriously because without that, everything else falls apart.
So it's super important. It's hard to build from scratch. You have to really work, you have to do everything that we already talked about up here to like go step by step building the great product that people love that they wanna, wanna use and actually trust and then don't break that trust. Any other questions? Um, so in the last few years, we've seen a lot of like um, new products and services within consumer finance come out and things like um, online banking. Um, so my question is, do you think that these kind of like brick and mortar and physical banks will become obsolete eventually? I don't think all of them will. I think some of them will continue to exist. They will figure out how to innovate. They will change the way they do things to fit into whatever emerges from the FinTech explosion that we're seeing. And they'll be great partners. For, we've, we've talked about partnership a lot. Those, those companies will be great partners. Some probably won't. Some probably won't be able to figure it out. That's just normal business. Some make it, some do. But I do think that they're gonna continue to play a role in the ecosystem for a very long time. Um, they're just so entrenched. They have so much opportunity to change if they want to. And some of them are embracing that. There are some that are quite innovative, some that are quite not. And they're all finding their spot and some of them will continue to exist and some of them probably won't. Yeah, I think there's a stat that at least in the UK, um, banks are basically just like retail closing a lot of their branches because of the cost. But uh, I think even with, I can't remember which bank it was in the UK, the, the OPEX of actually running a given branch far exceeded any revenue. So it's just a complete cost center for them. Um, and I think analogous to retail, I don't believe, to, to David's point, I don't think that branches will go away, just like stores aren't going away. They're just being reimagined with the purposes. Um, and I think our, my hope for something like a firm 10, 15 years from now is that if we have branches, we have physical locations, they will be to serve those, you know, flyover states that we talked about earlier to help, you know, bridge the gap in trust. So you're more consultative when you walk in a branch versus just transactional stuff that can be done in your phone. Um, but not sure. We'll see. They're trying. Um, I think they're, they're certainly trying varying degrees of success. And I think a lot of them look to companies like ours to partner with and incubate that technology back into their own sort of apps and things like that. There's also been a fair amount of acquisition within financial services over the last few years to exactly this point. How can they bolt something on? Uh, that would compete. But again, I think just like we, my, my guess is like we spoke about earlier, they are so systemic. These are like trying to turn a cruise ship <laughs> over time. They don't have the technology. They don't have the engineering talent that they need to kind of catch up. So you see what Goldman Sachs did is like, oh, let's put a, you know, this uh, floor in our office, two floors in our office, Marcus. So it's like, that's our startup within Goldman Sachs. And I met with many of those guys and like, we cannot hire a single engineer in New York because they're all coming out of these companies. So I just don't, I don't see how realistic that's going to be to build. All right. So you guys see a ton of uh, consumer data. Uh, can you tell us sort of the health of the U.S. consumer and do you see any cracks or concerns out there that we should be worried about? Uh, are we under NDA? Invest now. Oh, wait, no, don't invest now. I, I think not about our consumer data, but we are starting to see, and this is publicly available, uh, credit delinquencies pick up a little bit with credit card repayment, um, which is always a pretty clear leading indicator of recession, like so many other things going on right now. Um, I think it actually, we're somewhat protected from that because our uh, our loan book or our portfolio of loans is generally shorter term, 12 months or shorter. The longer your term you go out, especially in the mortgages and auto loans, the more susceptible you are to the interest rate shocks and, and delinquency. Um, but I think macro trend, our credit team monitors that very, very closely, and we're starting to see a bit of a dip. Okay, I think that's a wrap. Um, thank you, Vish, David, and Chris for joining us today, and thank, ev thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Stella. We're all going to be floating around for maybe another 30 minutes, so feel free to hang out, meet new people, and thank you, everyone, again. Thank you.